Hey everyone, we'll get started with our next talk. It is uh, compounding interest, building your way to better nutrient removal performance. And Jeffrey Zoller um, with HDR will be our, our presenter. Jeffrey is a professional engineer who has worked in wastewater process design for nearly 20 years. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Montana State and a Master's of Science and Engineering from the University of Washington. Currently serves as a professional associate with HDR Engineering. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for, for joining. Um, my talk this morning is gonna be a short summary of a couple of your efforts um, at what we kind of called recommissioning um, of a biological process at a Puget Sound uh, treatment plant. And the process was engaged with nitrogen removal in mind. Um, however, it involves a broader elements of, of operation strategy, troubleshooting, um, controls, hydraulics, all kinds of things. So I hope this presentation is useful to folks involved in any form of optimization, whether you want to use that word, um, as a way to look at what um, and how you can make the most of what you have and efficient ways to try to step it forward. Okay, so quick agenda. Um, I'm gonna take you through a short introduction just to give you a project background, get you oriented to the project. Um, then I'm gonna do a short couple slides on nitrification, denitrification basics. Um, most folks, I'm sure you've seen at least one of these already, but just in case, I'll take a minute to cover um, basic vocabulary so we're all on the same page. Um, and then I'm gonna take you through three phases of this where um, it was the initial desktop analysis of the system in conjunction with the operations staff um, which was critical here um, to work with them on this. And then the field upgrades that we did at the plant before we did full scale um, uh, recommissioning. And the goal was then to initiate that full scale recommissioning and start to look at the initial results. And there's a lot of complexities that'll go in with that, but we'll talk through that shortly. So the Central Kitsap Treatment Plant, this is Kitsap County's um, primary treatment facility. They have four treatment plants. If you're in a Meow Meow's talk earlier yesterday, you know there's four total. This is their largest. Um, and it, it completed a major upgrade in uh, 2016 that allowed it to be able to do enhanced biological nutrient removal. It has a, a four basin system uh, with six sequential zones in each, in each basin, basically a four stage Barden foe. Um, swing zones, internal mixed liquor recirculation, methanol addition, um, uh, upgraded uh, blower technology. So the liquid stream had had a lot of work done and a lot of tools available to it. Uh, annual average flows, that's, that's a little on the high end. It's more three to five MGD uh, with some peaks max month and peak hour it gets over 10, it's over 13. Um, the facility as a whole, just for, for context, um, it has traditional primary and secondary clarifiers, um, mesophilic anaerobic digestion, centrifuge dewatering. And these will come into play as we, as we talk through this. But the key thing to note here is that the plant, since its initiation of its upgrade, was preparing itself for nutrient removal that everyone knew was coming, but it has not really commissioned itself to operate in that mode um, fully. So it started to take, make use of these tools, but not really operating it as a full aggressive BNR facility in line with the original, with the original design intent. And so the initial goal of this project was essentially to try to do that. Um, part of its value for the operation staff, because they get to start operating the plant um, as a full aggressive BNR during a time period where they're not necessarily required to do that on their permit, but they can start to gain the experience and knowledge at that point. So that's where we use the phrase recommissioning. It's really just sort of bringing the plant up to the point where it's making full use of all the tools that are available to it. And it's got good tools. Um, in addition to that, while we're doing this process, we wanna take the advantage to look at where we can optimize and possibly make even additional uh, improvements to be able to help that process work as efficiently as possible. And this will cycle into the general permit requirements for, for Puget Sound. When we started this process, the general permit was not a bit out yet. So we didn't have it directly in mind. It came out halfway through. Um, and so obviously that puts limits on Kitsap as a significant discharger when it comes to, to total inorganic nitrogen. And it puts requirements on them when it comes to documenting optimization, nutrient removal, evaluation, so forth that are required. And so while we didn't have that directly in mind when we started the process, what we're doing certainly is going to feed into that. We're, we're going to be producing data and information that can, that can be used to 
um, establish and evaluate uh, um, for that general permit. So it's there, it's hiding in the background, we know it's there and uh, we need to deal with it appropriately. Um, so quick little bit of vocabulary, um, reminder that the, the general permit for, for Puget Sound is focused on total inorganic nitrogen um, uh, as far as the speciation between dissolved and particulate. Um, uh, not that the others are not important, but this is obviously the focal point for the permit, so it's the focal point for the work that we're doing. Um, uh, ammonia, nitrate, and nitrite. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm, I'm typically going to associate uh, an assumption that nitrite is generally very low, so um, the, the nitrate concentration and ammonia combined are fairly close to, to the TIN. So that's, um, that's a little bit inaccurate, but it's a common assumption I'll make for the sake of simplicity. Second bit of vocabulary, um, just to keep everyone with the same grammar here. Um, the process that is in place, the four-stage BAR info, is obviously utilizing standard um, uh, biological nutrient removal for, for nitrogen. We're focused on two species, and this is, as we bring the plant up to full commissioning, we need to keep in mind the differences here between our, our nitrifiers, which are going to set the SRT of the plant. They're the slow growers, they're sensitive to temperature, they're sensitive to toxicity. So they're gonna be critical for us to make, maintain stable nitrification if we're gonna move the plant um, out of sort of partial BNR into full, full BNR like it was designed to do. Um, and then of course you have the denitrifiers which are more robust um, in, in one sense, but they're also gonna be, um, um, you have to be careful of substrate, the limitations there. And the issues are going to create, um, create some challenges, particularly for this plant, as you'll see. So just to emphasize the process train, uh, the four-stage bar info shown on the left there, that's a typical schematic. And on the right is sort of a plan view of the stage system that's located at, at uh, Central Kitsap. So as you look on the bottom right of this, um, Kitsap system is a, is a, is a Six pass system, it starts with the first zone or pass. They use those terms interchangeably, so why? Um, first pass is anoxic. You have three stages, two, three, four, that are aerobic. At the end of that aerobic stage, you have mixed liquor return, um, internal mixed liquor return. And then you have a swing stage, um, stage five, usually operated anoxic if we're gonna be in nutrient remote, removal mode. And then you have a polishing six stage. It's essentially re-aeration and catching anything that made it through and giving you good oxygen on the way to the, to the secondary clarifiers. Um, this is an excellent system for good, robust uh, BNR. Um, it's effective and it leaves a lot of room for play too. Um, when you think about, we have methanol. Well, how do you feed the methanol? What, what variable are you basing it on? How, how are you doing the returned, uh, the recycle? What, what are you controlling that off of? Um, that aeration zone, are you tapering the air as you go through it so that that anoxic is more efficient at the end, or are you not? Are you keeping everything at a stable high level? So within this zone, there's, within this type of arrangement, there's a lot of room for play, um, as well as, as great potential for nutrient removal. The plant just needs to move up and, uh, and actually start operating in this mode. So our initial modeling, um, we did wastewater characterizations to update uh, their influent parameters uh, for both wet weather um, and, and drier flows, which had different wastewater characteristics. And so we could account for those. Um, we set this up in a bioin model. This is a steady state model, but for the purposes of comparing full scale operational scenarios. If we're gonna bring this plant up and recommission it and target BNR, we wanna think, okay, as the operations staff sitting down, how do you wanna run this? All right, how do you feel comfortable running it? You've, you've played around with a lot of these parts of it for years now. Where do you feel the strengths and weaknesses are? How do we want to operate it? And so it's set up, um, as you can see, the liquid stream across the top, the six stages uh, with the, the methanol addition. This slide, though, I want to emphasize something else that you need to keep in mind for the rest of the talk, which is their solids train. That's not, um, that didn't have the same, same upgrades, um, wasn't part of the original project per se, but they have standard mesophilic anaerobic digestion, single stage, good SRTs, very typical. And so in this case, you're expecting a return stream that's gonna be relatively strong in, in nitrogen um, as any return stream would be in this situation, you know, maybe 20% of the load on the recycle. With Kitsap, Central Kitsap, they have the unique aspect of this plant along with the three others is the central solids processing facility. So all the biological solids produced at those other three plants come to this plant for processing. In addition, it's also the regional location for septage hauling, which means septage is coming to this plant and it's more and more and more every year. In fact, it's amazing them how much it is and they're committed to taking it. 
So they get septage loads, they get grease loads, they get uh, was loads from three other plants. The net effect of that is that their digesters functionally, only about 50% of the solids load to their digesters are actually solids that come from this plant. Another 50% come from offsite. So as you can imagine, if you're worried about a nitrate load, these, th this is gonna be more extreme because um, you're loading like a plant that's bigger than what you actually are. In addition to that, they do not have equalization on that centrate. So they dewater periodically uh, during day shifts during the week. So not only do they have more nitrogen load, but it comes in pulses. So while we are looking at it to compare results in a steady state approach, this is not steady state and you need to be prepared for that when you actually start commissioning. The other thing is to, is to talk with the operators in terms of how best to think about control. Um, at this point, when you're used to controlling off of total SRT, um, to take advantage of a system like this, you wanna start thinking in terms of what we call core aerobic um, SRT, meaning in a process like this, that boxed area in the center, where that's kind of that prime aeration zone um, in, a, in a four stage arrangement, um, that's only about 50% of your total SRT. You add in that final polishing zone, you're up to 67. But when you're talking about maintaining stable nitrification, that's, that's where you wanna focus your efforts because if you can't maintain SRT there, um, your total isn't gonna matter as much. And so we started also thinking in terms of process control and parameter control in terms of both aerobic and total SRT. Um, in conjunction with that, this also means you're gonna be operating at higher mixed liquors. So whereas you might be running at 1800 milligram per liter, now we're asking plant staff, you're gonna to need to move this up with three or four basins online, you're gonna to need to be, be north of 3000. And so perfectly doable, um, the plant is capable of doing that, but this is where we need to operate and that needs to be the, the normal spot. So when we did the desktop portion of this um, a while back, we kind of split it into two phases. Um, the, the yellow portion at the top is really talking about the baseline recommissioning. Good DO control, recycle control, the types of things you would typically have. They have methanol, they have that capability. That's already something or they already feed now. Um, there's just limitations on their control of it. Um, and then also while we're doing that, let's look at some things that are maybe way off in the future, like a side stream. Given the fact that their side stream is so aggressive, as I pointed out, this is obviously a piece of low hanging fruit that's very logical for them. Um, but if we're gonna do this recommissioning, especially in light of the general permit and the desire to look at, at optimization, what's, what's an easy thing that we could do that would help this four stage system possibly operate even better? Something we could do in the short term, something we can maybe implement right now before we do the recommissioning. And that's where we started looking at low DO or ammonia based aeration control. Some of the infrastructure for this is missing, but it was, it was a very short hop to get there. And so this was an obvious thing where the better we could control the DO, the more efficient we can make the, the infrastructure that they have in place. And this is kind of the idea of compounding value here. You've, got, you've spent a lot of money putting good infrastructure in place. You now wanna use it to its potential. What, what are all the ways you can help that occur and not hinder it? And that's what we want. They do have a step feed um, uh, method for this. It's not their primary BNR mode though. So we did look at that, but we didn't really carry it through to full scale, but I include it there for, for the sake of completeness. Um, when we did the initial modeling, and this is, this is some of the initial results for one particular flow condition, the 2028 uh, annual average flows. Like I said, this purpose here in steady state was to look at these scenarios to see, is there real value here? Would the operators want to do that? Could we see inherent value in there, both in recommissioning the plant and in, and in gaining that experience that they want to gain of running BNR more aggressively? And so you can see the yellow, the yellow approach up there where we're doing, we're doing DO control. One thing to note is that if you just ran the Barton flow in theory, um, straight up, didn't even add methanol, you can probably get high teens on, a, on, on tin, on an effluent. This is steady state, so it's, it's, it's being a little aggressive between what you probably would get in the field given the centrate equalization, but um, it's possible there. You can see exactly from the wastewater characterization when you start adding carbon, how significant that is. You drop down way below. You start, you start to bring it to where the plant's true potential is, which is getting below three. But you need a fair amount of methanol to do that. Um, side stream treatment takes a big bite out of it, but without methanol, you're only gonna get so far with it. And so when you move into, into ABAC or low DO, any kind of low DO operation like that, where you're trying to be more efficient, maybe increasing the mixed liquor return, what you can see there and, and to point out is that just, just implementing possibly some better aeration control has the potential to do as much good as, as, as side stream treatment would be on just kind of flatlining the DO. And so there, there's some inherent value in there. And while you're gonna get the same 
optimum level at the end. If you note option E here, which is an, an, an A back option, gets you down to below three on, on the TIN, which is very similar to what you could achieve up here. Your net result is about the same, but your methanol is about half and the stability of your process is likely to be improved as well. So in looking at this, when, when operators looked at this, when the plant staff looked at this, we're like, okay, we wanna do the recommissioning. And this gives us a clear path forward where we could do something like this that could give us an extra tool. And it won't be that hard to do, um, to be able to add this extra tool in the toolbox, make better use of this infrastructure that we've got and attempt to optimize it effectively. So before we could go into full scale recommissioning, we needed to make these changes that we had determined were gonna be valuable uh, to the plant staff. Um, and so we did this in four parts. And the reason being is because the basins, because the, all the main infrastructure was in place, this is a relatively low cost upgrade to do this. Um, the initial thing we needed to do is the, the plant had never actually gone through con full control loop testing when it came to their aeration control. They didn't have MOV in place. So operators were often tweaking valves um, themselves and deciding where air needed to go, which they were very, very good at it, but that's also labor intensive. And if we wanna automate the system, we need to get that up and running using using the original um, uh, structure that's in place. So we set them up to basically, we redeveloped control, control narrative and built them out to have the full MOV capability, meaning their valves and their blowers now work together so that you're not, you're not losing capacity, right? Your valves will open when they're appropriate, they'll close when they're appropriate, they won't throttle high pressure. You'll use your air and your control of it uh, to the maximum possible ability. And that's standard of practice for any, any um, aeration system, uh, current industry standard. And so that's really essential for the, for the recommissioning. We're never gonna do it without that. But on top of that, we added um, implements to help us control these things a little bit more, which was the ABAC control. Um, basically in, in doing, uh, using dual probes, we use some of the Hawk ISE probes to do this initial, initial run through, um, but placing them in the basins to give us additional control points so we could control off ammonia and not just air or not just DO. And we also implemented those probes. So it would give us a secondary option for the recirculation streams um, on the nitrate uh, for the internal mixed liquor. We could look at what the nitrates level were to, levels were to decide how best to utilize that anoxic zone. And then at the same time, we could also get control off methanol. Up to this point, the plant pretty much would just flatline methanol. You know, they, they knew about what they needed. They might tweak it on occasion, but they would feed it in there. So sometimes it's too much, sometimes it's not enough. Uh, and it's effective. But we, we wanted another control variable to, if we're going to commission this, let, let's, let's get control of that and, and make use of it. So we actually implemented physically all these. It took maybe six months. Um, they also replaced all their diffusers. So by the time we're ready to go into recommissioning, we have new diffusers, right? We have a new set of probes, which they had budget that year to do that. Let's just get them installed now. So as we're going to recommissioning, we've given ourselves a few tools that we think will be useful to us, as well as simply now bringing the plant up to a point where operators can start to gain experience um, uh, running it uh, more aggressively. Um, to summarize this, I want to show you just a quick, we have this in mind, a quick, uh, quick graph here. So this is, this is one of their basins. This is example left to right. So flows passing left to right. Um, pass one is where we placed the ammonia probe um, and pass five. The ammonia and nitrate probes that are in pass five give us an idea to see how well that core aerobic zone is working, right? If, if, if ammonia is bleeding through, um, we want to increase air, right? If it's not, we can decrease air and make that and help improve recirculated oxygen to the front of, of the of the four stage system. That system here, the, the probe in, in a pass five also gives us the capabilities to um, control methanol a little bit better. We can look at where we're actually limited on substrate. If we have a lot of, if we have a lot of nitrate build up there, we can increase substrate. We have another variable to look at to decide when to turn that pump up and down. In the first stage, we can watch nitrate give us an idea of, of recirculation rates. If in that front zone, we are in a position where nitrate starting to rise in that anoxic, we've essentially exceeded the capacity of our anoxic zone. So recirculating more flow is not doing us any good. It's just sending more oxygen back to the front of the plant. We can tone down that recirculation rate. If our nitrate is low in that first anoxic zone, we can turn up that recirculation rate. We've got potentially unused denitrification capacity in that front zone. So these are relatively simple things. They didn't cost a whole lot to do and the, because the main infrastructure was already there, but they will certainly help us in allowing the plant to reach um, as much of the potential as it can. 
So here's the fun part. I'm going to split this into centrate and non-centrate days uh, because they have they were different, and so let's look at them differently. When we initially started this process, um, we we went for about six months, and this was what I would call rough recommissioning. Um, we got a chance to both test control loops and move biology at the same time. Tried to do it as sequentially as we could, and we're learning quickly. Not time to chant, chant, had to do all the different set points that we would have wanted to, but we were able to work through quite a bit. And one thing you'll note here, this is, this is on days when they were processing centrate. So the nitrate load, uh, the nitrogen load is very hard to control. For the first three months of our full scale testing, if you look from, we started basically January, um, uh, 2022. For that first till about mid-March, we had a heck of a time getting stable nitrification, which of course we walked into thinking this will be the easy part. Um, and it, it wasn't. And we're gonna talk about why, and this is where some of the interesting optimization things come up when you find stuff like this. Needless to say, once we got the mixed liquor and the SRT under control, you can see the ammonia, which is the blue line, uh, dropped down and we were able to keep that relatively consistent for the remainder of the, of the period. Um, it still, it, it bounces around more than I would like, but we got stability in the sense, just um, I would like to tighten those bands um, with additional testing, but we were able to do that. When we initiated ABAC, um, this is just basic DO control strategy um, using it. When we initiated ABAC, we, we, we again saw some drop in improvement here. This is very rough ABAC. We didn't push it very hard. When we talk about low DO, we're talking maybe one milligram per liter. So we're, we were just making sure the control loop could actually function and do what we wanted it to do because then there's plenty of time to try and, and push it even harder. That worked well, but we saw some, again, the instability when we tried looking at the um, uh, instituting the uh, mixed liquor return on the nitrate. We just barely got that in at the end of the period, so didn't really get a chance to test it. But the control loop was functional, so it works. So the operators have something they can keep trying the tool now. We just weren't able to get much data on it. One thing to note here, though, is even though we were, we were nitrifying uh, very well, we, we couldn't get it very low. Um, this is effluent composite sampling. And so even with the polishing stage, with that centrate return, it was awful hard to get below two um, just because of the loads and the cycling that was coming through. Now, if you go to a, a non-centrate day, so this is, we're getting a more, more typical pattern here. We don't have the load coming back that's as aggressive. Same issue that we had at the front, the blue line's ammonia, and that started to come down and we got that stabilized once the mixed liquor and the SRT, once we got that under control. And we'll, like I said, we'll talk about why that was a bit of a challenge. Um, and it was, you know, it bounced, but it was better performance certainly than, than the centrate days. Now, the ammonia got down for a lot of the time we were able to keep below 0.5 then. It just shows you the difference between having equalization and not. When the centrate wasn't there, it was, it was very consistent nitrification. It was solid. Um, there was still some bouncing because there still is some challenges there, but it was pretty good. When we initiated ABAC, and like I said, this is rough ABAC um, to do that, we actually got some of our best days, in which case that was times where we were at, we had weeks at a time where we were able to get below three, almost two. Um, on the TIN. Um, and then we actually seemed to introduce some instability when we tried the MLR, IMLR uh, recycle and didn't just flow pace it. Uh, but the net effect is that, yes, we were able to get down, we were able to get consistent with this, just not nearly as trim as we want, but the control loops were working. They were responding as the way they should, and the operators were able to get some experience running at these stages and seeing where things were bouncing when blowers were coming off and on. And it gives you an idea of what the plant's potential is, um, even though we couldn't run it for a particularly long time. So for people who like tables instead of graphs, here's a table instead of a graph. Um, this is the testing period that we went through and, and each different month on both centrate days and non-centrate days. The where I want you to focus though is kind of in the second to the bottom column here where it says 315.22. So because of that difficulty in getting stable nitrification, if you focus in on the time period where we, we had that solid, you know, that was in place and that was working well, um, even on centrate days, on average, our variability was, was fairly high, but the TIN we got under 10, and that wasn't even trying that hard. I mean, we, we, we got it there with, with a good solid effort, but not tons of refinement. On non-centrate days, we dropped it about another three milligram per liter, and that was pretty consistent across that. And that had our best days where we had periods of time where we were under three um, for, for several, several sample periods. And so... What this gives you an idea is, is you can kind of tease out in here some of the value of that, that pulsing centrate that's coming back that's particularly aggressive for this plant, but also the fact that, that the operators, um, to, their, to their great credit, were able to move up to a very different SRT and mixed liquor approach 
and, and got this um, while testing control strategies on the fly um, and troubleshooting them. Um, they got this up to the point where it's like they, they, were, they were getting significantly better um, uh, um, TIN than what they had historically done. And we'll talk about that in terms of the, the general permit. So this is, this, is the, this is the most fun part, um, which is to run through a few of the options here of where we, um, where we found the interesting things for optimization. Um, one thing that you note in a plant like this where surprisingly they have lots of, lots of very detailed tools that are wonderful to have, but we actually had trouble with things like RAS recirculation. We, we had limitations on how we could flow pace the RAS. We had upper limits uh, with the pumping. We had lower limits due to the design of their secondary clarifiers. And because of that, we, we couldn't really flow pace it as aggressively as we wanted to. Um, where that comes into play is when you look at the graphs at the bottom, for, for CKTP, their load comes in at the same, their nitrogen load comes in at the same time as their flow. That isn't always the same for every plant, but in this case, um, it is. And what happens there is, is if, your S, if, your, if your RAS rate is essentially constant, as your flows increase and your load's coming into the plant, you're essentially moving your inventory um, out of your basins into your clarifier at the exact time when you need it in your basins. Um, and then at night, when, you, when the load goes down, you're moving that inventory back into the basins. So this creates kind of one of those unfortunate loops where, where you're, you're essentially taking a little bite out of your, your Bardenfo process uh, that you don't need to take. Now you couple that with the centrate equalization. So I wanna describe this for just a moment. On the top right is a graph that shows a typical day where they're feeding centrate. I picked out these just to be good examples, but about 9 a.m., you see the centrate pump kicks on, running about 150 gallons per minute, and you go for eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, and you stop. Um, and what you can see in the bottom left is the result of that type of thing, where this is zone five uh, in the profile. Um, these are three basins that were online, basin one, three, and four, each of them different color there. And there's some differences between them. You notice each of these basins has some definitive character, but you can see what's happening to the ammonia that's bleeding through that core anoxic zone. The pulsing is getting so high where even though I might be averaging well less than 10, I'm seeing 15, 20, 25 at times that's bleeding through uh, my core aerobic zone simply because of how heavily I'm hitting it at the front end. You couple this with that RAS issue, you compound it with the RAS issue where my biology might not be where I want it to be. Um, and so it's, the biology may not be there. And on top of that, I'm, I'm hitting it harder than ever. And so this, this makes it hard to stabilize a, a process. And then this one is probably one of the more interesting. Um, as we were looking at this process during that early stage where I showed you how we had more trouble than we thought we would need to to get to, to stable nitrification. Um, one of the reasons being, um, that I'm theorizing is that upstream of their basins, uh, um, they have a splitter box that's hydraulically meant to bring RAS and primary effluent together, mix them, and then distribute them to all the, all the basins, right? Makes perfect sense, right? Centrate's coming in too, so it's all mixed together, even hydraulically efficient to, uh, to establish between all of these. Um, what was happening though, in this box, you can see it at the center there, from the top, the RAS is entering and my suspicion is as it was entering, it was favoring one of the basins and immediately leaving um, and essentially overloading one basin compared to the other. The primary effluent is coming in in the bottom right, the two lines that are coming in from the bottom right, it comes in and it tends to, because of its hydraulic inertia, favor shooting straight across the basin into the two, into two of the, of the three that are online. So the net effect of this is that you're tending to send your RAS towards one basin and your load towards others. All right, this exacerbates the RAS recirculation issue. It exacerbates the centrate issue because the biology and the, and the loading are not, not conjoined. The reason why we, we look at this and in theory, you're like, oh, maybe that's happening. What we were seeing was that we had vast differences between mixed liquor in, in two parallel basins. So we could have one basin that was operating steady at 3,100 milligrams per liter. The basin next to it was operating at 2,200. And so that's a big of a difference where where we're having trouble with a third of the biology difference between just keeping them stable in the basins. And that's, that's something where then we're essentially taking, taking another a bite out of our efficiency of the overall process. And so this is purely a hydraulic thing, but it's an optimization issue. Um, this is a point where we can, we can make a definitive step forward if we want. The operators were able to separate the RAS and the PE and send them separately to the anoxic zones. That allowed us to kind of get that mixed liquor back up where it should and even out the SRT. But it was, it was a little bit of a, 
playing with gates uh, mode to be able to do this, which is always a tough thing to control off of. But overall, the concept of the box is what we want. It's just hydraulically, we're seeing some effects that, that make it difficult to uh, fully optimize the BNR. So last item is aeration control. Um, this one I spent a lot of time on in design. So this was one I kind of tracked during this process. But on the top right, I want to give you an example. This was one that we had in the rough ABAC mode. And by, by that, I mean, we had, we had a, a system in gray where you're looking at the set point. So the basin, based on the ammonia load, is changing the DO set point from three. Three was where we let it go, we, we, as high as three and, and down to one. So we, we artificially bookended this. This was our, our issue. We could let it go wider if we wanted. But the system, is the actual DO, which is in blue, is following pretty well. It has some excursions, but it's moving up and down with the, the demand call. And that's basin three, zone two. Basin four, zone two, you'll notice it's trying to do the same thing. That gray line is saying, please give me one milligram per liter. Please, 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 please. And it's, it's, it's not making it, it's not doing it. So here we have something where we're artificially putting in more DO than we want. That's taken a knock on our BNR efficiency. And it's likely due to the fact that we probably have limitations on the valve turned down. We're at minimum air. We have nowhere other location to waste it. Um, the valve throttles as much as it can. And so we've run into a physical limitation in the system. It's a great thing to find because now we have something to target effort at in the future. And then the last thing I wanna just comment is on the general permit. If you look at how roughly we were able to set up this plant, even if you did nothing else beyond what we did, their efficiency is significantly higher already um, to the point where if I applied the 10 limits for centrate um, and non-centrate days that we were able to reach just in that rough recommissioning period, their projected annual average loads um, are um, already at probably about a third of what the, the general permit would require them. So clearly the potential's there, the value, the value is high and they can continue to refine this. So with the GP, the last thing I just wanna note is that when you go through a process like this, this is, this is high value for operators to learn their system and to be able to operate aggressively. And you learn a ton of things about where you can make improvements. One of the things in the general permit is to make sure that you're categorizing every bit of optimization you do and don't think something is not optimization. If you make a hydraulic improvement, that's optimization. If you improve your RAS pumping, hey, I can flow pace it better, that's optimization. If you add redundant systems so you're less likely to fail, that's optimization. All of these things stabilize a system and you can see they create problems. You know, when I can't throttle a valve down, it limits it, right? It's not gonna be what BioN says, it's gonna be what we can actually do. And so we did all these things as part of this process, not only giving them the recommissioning experience, but really helping them be able to do this. And these are all things that are gonna feed into those optimization reports. And in addition, we're able to tear out what's the priorities for the rest of the system. So high priority, we need that centrate equalization. We need, we need to do additional seasonal testing to see if we can hold below that three and start playing with the set points a little bit more. We need to get the continued work with the, with the um, um, IMLR and the methanol automation that we can do that. Those are high value things that we find that are not high cost. And we know them because we can, we can definitively see them. And then moderate priority items like let's fix that aeration system. Let's get better throttling and control so we can help control that DO a little bit better. Um, and then also keep side stream treatment on there too. They've got a great, they're in a great position for, for, for the future, but given their centrate load and the continued ability to take um, septage, that's always something that we should keep on the table long-term and they can see the value of that and they can point to real data and say, this is why it's valued. So with that, I will end and just a couple things to note, uh, Kitsap has wonderful lab staff, some of the best I've ever worked with. Um, and uh, thanks to Meow Meow, who's our partner, Murray Smith. Uh, Bryce did our modeling and uh, you need good programmers, go to those two at uh, QCC. Um, I love working with uh, Ben and Nathan, they are, extremely competent programmers and uh, made all this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, and just a reminder, it's a live stream. So if anyone has questions, Mike there in the middle of the room and I'd be happy to meet you halfway. What kind of blowers do you guys have there? Oh, they have um, two air bearing um, uh, uh, airs in units that they utilize. 
Um, pretty good turn down, about uh, 2,000 to 4,000 uh, SCFM that they can do. Um, most of their capacity is covered by those two blowers very well, um, but they do, they do top out a little bit on occasion and they do have limits on the low side. There were clearly times when we were doing the commissioning where I needed less air and I was having a hard time getting less air. And so one of the obvious things that we could do was essentially either, either create a blow off or we could, we could, we could waste air um, and possibly get them maybe a little bit smaller control valves so we can throttle a little bit better. Um, but there's a combination there between the two. But otherwise, um, the, the blowers functioned very well. And once we got them on an MOV mode, um, they, they responded nicely. Um, they also have some multi-stage centrifugal that they're keeping as backup. So one of their long-term things is to start popping those out and getting more turbos in so they can have a more reliable system. But yes, that's what they're operating. Yeah, Jeffrey, I had a question on the uh, ammonium and nitrate probes. Sounds yeah. like those were new to the plant staff. Um, what's the maintenance schedule, you know, calibration schedule that they've taken on with those and, um, and how do they like them? Yep. So they're kind of, they're working through the long-term one. And for those of you who have dealt with these probes a long time, you know, it's kind of a learning curve when you get them and they're new. So initially we had, we had replacements on the heads, trying to get them calibrated, figure out how those work. And we got them dialed in much better by the end of the process in the end. But those types of probes do take focused effort. Um, you, you've got to replace them on a regular basis. You've got to maintain calibration. Um, the trick that we had with this is they worked very well as long as we were operating, you know, kind of above that one to two milligram per liter range. Um, they always tended to read higher than the lab by one or two milligram per liter, even when we got them calibrated. Um, but it was fairly, seemed to be a fairly reliable difference. So from a controls perspective, you may use the lab to give definitive results on your, your final effluent. But from a controls, um, as long as they're stable, um, we can still use them well as a control parameter. The one thing we learned from this that I would say we probably would do is maybe on that zone five, if we start pushing it farther, we might move to maybe a wet chemistry uh, type of probe, simply because it's going to become more critical for us to, if we're down at half a milligram per liter or, or you know, less than one on ammonia, we'd like to know that really accurately. And I, I don't know that this is the right probe for that. Um, but for, for what we were doing at this stage, I think it was, they, they were effective. Um, I know you said that it seemed like the mixed liquor return, your strat, mixed liquor return strategy didn't work out so well. Could you talk a little bit more about your strategy there and what your parameters were? So in that case, the, we switched kind of the, the plants, um, control spreadsheets to uh, start focusing on calculating aerobic SRT on a regular basis along with total so that we could watch that as more of a control parameter. And they, they would adjust their wasting rates so we could kind of get up to where we, we, could, we could on a stable basis stay at that, at that about nine day aerobic or better. And that, that did get us excellent nitrification. Once we got there, it did exactly what you would, what you would expect. Um, but the RAS rates, um, initially what they had been doing was pretty much just keeping them at a set flow. So you're kind of constantly sending back the same amount of rest. You might make a manual adjustment. You know, an operator might say, let's go up, but it was, it was a choice you made. Otherwise it would just keep running at the same, same flow. Flow pacing it, um, we ended up instituting what I would call the, this is like numeric calculus flow pacing, where uh, let's pretend we're doing blocks like this instead of a continuous curve. And we, we broke up the day into a few different periods where the operators could set set points and say, okay, for this four hour period, let's run at this then automatically change it because we were, we were having difficulty actually doing a constant, consistent um, flow pace, which is where we want to go. So we kind of roughed it out a little bit. And then, like I said, they ended up splitting the RAS and the mix and the primary effluent into two sides of the splitter box and sending it to the anoxic zone separately. They were able to control it a little bit better in that instance. So while we were flow pacing it to do, you know, a, um, a steady rate where, where um, we're getting recirculation from the IMLR. So whether you're doing say half Q or one Q on the, on the RAS, you can pace that fairly well. Um, it's a little rough and we unfortunately had to split them up. We couldn't pre-mix them, which lost us some efficiency. We had to wait till the anoxic zone to actually get the primary effluent and the RAS in contact with each other. But by doing that, we got the mixed liquor stabilized um, within a couple hundred milligram per liter per basin. Um, and we were able to kind of pseudo flow pace the RAS so that we could try to limit 
that effect of inventory movement. So try to keep the inventory in the basins, speed up that, that RAS when we knew the, the loads were coming, get it up to at least the maximum that we could do um, for that period of time, and then slow it down at night. So I have a couple blocks of time where we could, we could pace it. So that helped out significantly um, uh, to be able to do that. Though I think we, we want to get a true full pacing on that, and that's where we weren't able to, to get to. Great. Thanks, Jeffrey. All right.